Live from downtown Detroit, Local 4 News at 6 starts now. Storm Tracker 4 showing why it may be a few more hours before you can go outside without an umbrella as a long east to west line of rainy weather rolls through southeast Michigan. Some parts of our viewing area are under a flood advisory. Yeah, Brett Collar putting Storm Tracker 4 through its paces today, Brett. It's been busy. It's been lighting up, that's for sure, with the heavy rain that we've seen. Again, we mentioned this earlier, Washington and Wayne counties technically still under a flood advisory until 6.15 p.m. With all the heavy rain wash off, there could be some streams, creeks, and rivers on the rise, along with some ponding on the roads. Here's the setup from earlier. You'll see some of these spotty showers start to go, but then watch all these boundaries kind of interact. Then everything kind of bubbles up, giving way to very heavy rain. It was almost stationary for a while, but it eventually did shift further south and it gave way to some decent rain totals. Some spots well over an inch and a half. According to radar estimates, much needed rain this evening, though, we're going to dry things out and set the stage for a great weekend. We'll talk about that in just a bit. Don't forget the local forecasters app is the best tool, especially if you're going to be out this evening. Track any lingering showers, get the 10 day forecast all there in the palm of your hands. Tonight we're learning more about the gunman who shot and killed Detroit police officer Lauren Quartz. We now know the gun used was legally sold at Action Impact Firearms and Indoor Gun Range in East Point, but it's still not clear who actually purchased the gun. Local 4 investigators have uncovered 19-year-old Imani Davis's run-ins with the law in East Point over the past year and a half. Among the incidents, a warrant issued for a misdemeanor listed as family offenses on May 30th. Police believe Davis may have been trying to commit suicide by cop given his behavior July 6th and his troubled past. We heard Police Chief James White talk yesterday about violence and guns in our city. He's also talked about the heroics of his officers. Tonight we have new insight about the night Officer Lauren Quartz was murdered. Let's bring in Local 4 investigator Karen Drew with what she's uncovered tonight. Yeah. Well, Jason and Kim, I was able to obtain documents detailing what occurred from 12 a.m. July 6th to midnight of that day. A 24 hour snapshot of a day in our city. The night officer Quartz was shot down and killed in the line of duty. July 6th, 2022, Detroit. The crime starts early for the Violent Crimes Task Force. According to a major crime summary report from that day, it was 12.50 a.m., a report of an armed carjacking. 9947 Pinehurst. Victim told police he had just gotten gas. Suspects followed him home and approached him with an AR-15 style rifle. The victim was told to drop his belongings. The suspects grabbed his stuff and his car and took off. 10.30 in the morning, 11272 West Outer Drive, 47-year-old man found in driver's seat of a vehicle with a gunshot wound to the head, suspect unknown. 7.40 that night, 14725 Joy Road. The call Officer Lauren Course responded to ends with a gunshot wound to the officer's neck, fatal. Detroit police have lost one of their own. The violence doesn't stop. Next call comes in at 849, 3813 St. Clair. Detroit fire responds to a house fire. A man about 30 to 35 found inside with a gunshot wound. He is dead. One 24 hour cycle in our city. A carjacking, a gunshot wound, an officer killed, another man found dead in a burning home. July 6th, 2022, Detroit. So hard to believe all that happened in our city in just one day, one 24 hour cycle. Yeah, Incredible. and a DPD killing obviously gets the headlines, but you see what else is yeah. what happened in one day. Right. There's so with. much going on in our city, re what reference to guns and what these officers are dealing with. The chief mentioned it all week yeah. and it's it's heartbreaking and obviously it needs to change. Yeah, yeah. indeed. Karen, we appreciate it. Ford Motor Company tonight with a warning for drivers of two of its better selling luxury SUVs. Don't park the vehicles near buildings. The reason under hood engine fires. The company today updating an earlier recall. Local Four business editor Rod Maloney live tonight for us and Rod. Thankfully there is a fix here. 
Yes, uh, it is, although it's probably not one that owners are going to be happy with on the immediate level. Now, let's talk about this. Ford has had quality problems recently between the Bronco engine, the, uh, the F-150 Lightning, and the Mach-E. They've had recalls as well. So here we go, and this is what Ford is saying tonight. Here are the vehicles impacted, the 2021 Expedition and Navigator SUVs with build dates between July 27th of 2020 and August 31st of 2021. Total number of vehicles is now 66,221, about double the original number recalled. Now, just under two dozen have had under hood fires. Five of those since the original recall, 18 were rentals. The company saying tonight, quote, Ford is still advising customers to park their vehicles outside and away from structures until the dealer services their vehicle for this recall action. Vehicles may pose a risk of underhood fire, including while the vehicle is parked and off, end quote. That is small comfort for owners. Yet it goes on to say, quote, Ford believes the cause of these vehicle fires can be traced to a change in manufacturing location by a supplier during the COVID-19 pandemic, end quote. But Ford says it has figured out the fix, and the details are fairly complicated. Guidehouse Insights auto analyst Sam Abelsami tells local Ford tonight that Ford has battled quality problems for quite some time now, particularly with initial quality. It's always a concern when, a man, when an automaker is having a lot of quality issues, especially a lot of safety recalls. Uh, it hurts confidence in the brand. Um, and particularly for Ford right now, uh, they are launching a lot of new products. And it always costs far more to fix something after the fact in a recall than it does to ensure that it goes out of the factory right the first time. Now, I did mention the fix is complicated. It has to do with wiring in the battery junction box. That's all stuff that your dealer is likely to take care of. Uh, you won't be hearing from your dealer, though, for a while because Ford won't be able to send out the, the letters to go and get your car fixed until probably the end of August, early September, when they get all of the parts together that they need. That's how these things normally go. So it's going to be a while before these vehicles can get parked in the garage again. Back to you. Well, something I was wondering a couple recalls ago, Rod, that all of the, this has to be very costly. What does it do to Ford's profitability? Well, it hurts them, uh, uh, Jason. It's one of those things where they're already getting hit by the chip shortage, and that's uh, staunching the amount of vehicles they can produce. But this is also making them bring the vehicles back and spending money on them, and that's really millions off of the bottom line. Right. So in the end, say you're working on the line, you're looking for that bonus check next spring. Well, this is a problem for that. Well, serious ramifications. All right, Rod, thanks. Well, today, President Biden signing an executive order aimed at protecting access to reproductive health services. President Biden says the order will safeguard access to abortion care, contraceptives and protect patient privacy. It will also set up an interagency task force to use, quote, every federal tool available to protect access to reproductive health care. The White House says the order will increase public education efforts and the legal options available to those seeking and providing abortion services. And right now, there's a Another frontier developing in the fight over reproductive rights, IVF clinics and patients growing increasingly anxious about anti-abortion laws and frozen embryos. If lawmakers define embryos as people, the testing, storage and destruction of embryos could have legal consequences. Dr. David Riley says he wants to educate people on the IVF process. If you've ever sat in the office with an individual or a couple who's gone through multiple miscarriages. They're afraid they will never have a family. It's brutal. Why are we freezing embryos? So that doesn't happen. Yeah. An exclusive look at one clinic's plan to provide a safe haven for embryos. That's ahead at 6.30 on NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. There have been a lot of stories of bad travel experiences lately, but this one's among the worst. An eight hour flight across the Atlantic with no running water. Let's bring in Grant Herms. Uh, and Grant, I know we've heard experts say this is rare, but travelers might have to expect more inconveniences like this until airlines can get back up to speed. Yeah, Jason, this really has been a perfect storm for bad travel right now. I know we've talked about this a lot, but it has been things like post-pandemic 
rather uh, pre or post pandemic uh, travel surges, so called revenge serve, and then pre pandemic layoffs leading to staffing shortages. Now, all of that leading to big messes both on the ground and in the air. A nightmare flight, eight hours from London's Heathrow Airport to Detroit without Wi Fi, coffee, or working water which meant no working bathroom or sinks for hand washing. On board, University of Michigan Regent Jordan Acker, who tweeted about the flight, saying he was told by the flight crew there has been no water for a week on this plane. The crew leaving hand wipes in the bathroom for passengers and flight attendants having to pour a bottle of water in the toilet every 20 minutes to keep them working. The pilot telling those on board, just be honest about your service. But while this flight mare may be an extreme problem, experts think it's linked to staffing shortages after airlines laid off thousands when the pandemic hit, only to have to retrain workers, holding up flights and letting lower level maintenance issues go unchecked. So I think there were some decisions perhaps made based on what we're seeing now that has caused the problems coming out of COVID in the post pandemic flying that and what's been dubbed revenge travel people flocking to airports to get back to traveling they lost while they were forced to stay at home you have to be ready for it even though we're back to pre-pandemic levels we're not actually back to full inventory in regards to what we had in 2019 we're very close but the airlines aren't exactly there yet and because they can't manage it um so that's the biggest problem now, late this afternoon, Delta saying that this was a tough decision made in the moment. They're saying the crew only learned about this water failure on board that plane during the boarding process, not the week prior, like the crew had supposedly said. But in a statement this afternoon, a Delta spokesperson telling me, quote, we apologize to our customers for this experience, which falls far short of what we know our customers expect and deserve when traveling with Delta. But either way, not a fun flight, Jason. You would definitely want to know before you got on that plane. Uh, Grant, I'm curious, <laughs> did customers get compensated in any way for this? So customer service is reaching out, at least that's what Delta told me this afternoon. Again, they said this was just one of those things they had to make in the moment. It was either take this flight without working water or leave people stranded in London. Neither a good option there, but a lot of headaches in the future. Maybe not this bad, but certainly in the future for a lot of travelers. Back Boy, to you. It certainly is. All right, Grant, we appreciate it. Yeah. Federal prosecutors open a new investigation into Kwame Kilpatrick's finances. They're trying to determine if he's paying back $1.7 million he owes taxpayers and the IRS. He started various business ventures since his prison sentence was commuted by former President Donald Trump. Most recently, he started asking for donations in $8,000 increments to buy a new home in a gated community in Orlando, although that request seems to have been taken down now. The U.S. Attorney's Office calls the investigation routine, but the effort could help prosecutors seize money or garnish income or tax returns.